Good afternoon, all. Uh, we're going to continue on with the uh, spinal cord injury lecture series. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking about neurogenic bladder after uh, spinal cord injury. Um, I guess, first off, somebody could give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and see the slides. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, so we're going to talk through uh, some definitions and uh, talk about the epidemiology of um, neurogenic bladder after spinal cord injury, that's gonna require us to spend some time looking at the anatomy and physiology of the usual bladder innervation, including um, somatic nervous system, sympathetic, as well as the parasympathetic nervous system. And then uh, we'll talk through some clinical evaluation pearls and uh, management strategies. So the clinical, uh, clinical practice guidelines for bladder management after spinal cord injury were, uh, I guess, first published in August of 2006 uh, through the Consortium of Spinal Cord Injury Medicine um, as sponsored by the Paralyzed Veterans of America. A lot of organizations go into making these uh, practice guidelines, including all of the ones on here. Some of you may be familiar with um, the uh, ACRM, American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, American Spinal Injury Association, um, and they've also used uh, the American Spinal Cord, I'm sorry, the Academy of Spinal Cord Injury Professionals uh, group to go through these. So let's just start off with um, why do we make urine? Uh, the uh, kidneys are filtering blood uh, to get rid of impurities. Um, and uh, they do that uh, through every pass through the kidneys, you create a certain amount of urine. Uh, the urine is passed from the kidneys through the ureters uh, and stored into the bladder. Um, the bladder at appropriate times is emptied uh, by contraction of the detrusor, that's the bladder smooth muscle, um, and relaxation of the uh, urethral uh, sphincter, um, both internal external sphincters as well as the pelvic floor uh, musculature. The lower tract in particular, uh, you recognize as having involvement of both the internal sphincter as well as the external sphincter. Um, and we have voluntary um, control over the external sphincter uh, in particular and the pelvic floor musculature to help maintain continence when necessary. So micturition, that is the, uh, the filling and emptying of the bladder, uh, Basically, we, look, we need to take a look at the micturition reflexes that include uh, sympathetic, more than uh, parasympathetic uh, fibers, allowing for detrusor uh, relaxation during filling. Uh, the internal external sphincter is going to contract and the detrusor will be stretched. And as you increase the stretch on the bladder, that will send afferent information back up to the spinal cord. For bladder emptying, the parasympathetic nervous system mediates most of the response uh, through activation of the detrusor. Um, the sympathetic nervous system backs off during this stretch and you have relaxation of the internal and external uh, sphincters as we go through there. So I've mentioned before that we uh, kind of look at this as a two by two tract um, where we're looking at uh, bladder activity and sphincter activity. The bladder activity can either be um, overactivity, so neurogenic detrusor overactivity, or NDO, or um, you can have too little bladder function in which the detrusor doesn't contract to empty, and that's called detrusor acontractility. The sphincters, um, similarly, can be either too tight or too loose. If the sphincter is too tight, uh, so for example, as you have reflex responses um, the afferent information sends information to the bladder that causes it to contract. When that happens, it increases the stretch at the sphincters and causes them to contract as well. If you have both sphincters and detrusor contracting at the same time, then the urine can only move one direction and that's upwards through the ureters and back to the kidneys. Um, that's called detrusor sphincter dysinergia. The main problem with that is you can cause acute renal fa uh, failure um, and subsequently death, which is, yes, suboptimal. Thank you. Um, if the sphincters are too loose, on the other hand, if you have a, a flaccid paralysis, a lower motor neuron injury, then you're gonna have intrinsic sphincter deficiency, ISD, 
and the person is going to be incontinent all the time. And that's not a good situation either. Um, not only uh, is it embarrassing uh, to not be able to control your sphincters and subsequently the urine leakage, um, but uh, it can also cause significant problems with the skin, uh, resulting in increased number of pressure injuries and those types of things. So this represents the relationship between the uh, lower urinary tract that is the detrusor and the sphincters as we're looking through there. What we are trying to achieve in a person with spinal cord injury who no longer has voluntary control over the sphincters is to maintain appropriate sphincter contractility and appropriate bladder contractility um, that is being able to gain some degree of bladder balance. So we need to spend a little bit of time talking through the bladder innervation. The somatic nervous system is what we usually think about as controlling our sphincters. Um, and, and that's mediated through the pedendal nerve, that's S2, S3, and S4, um, that provides innervation to the external sphincters and the pelvic floor musculature. So just go ahead and contract those for a moment, recognize that you have voluntary ability to do so and be thankful for that. Um, because after spinal cord injury, be it upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron, not only does the person um, not feel when their bladder is full or uh, whether their sphincters are tight enough that they cannot con uh, control uh, those contractions either one. Now remember the sympathetic nervous system arises from the thoracolumbar regions of the cord. The hypogastric nerve um, is uh, comprised of contributions from T10, T11, T12, L1 and L2. Um, and so those uh, nerve roots contribute to the hypogastric nerve, uh, which can cause detrusor relaxation by way of the beta-1 uh, adrenergic um, receptors, bladder neck contraction through the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, and bladder storage subsequently occurs under sympathetic uh, nervous system activation or dominance. With parasympathetic nervous system, remember that arises from the cranial sacral uh, portions of the neuroaxis, uh, but we are particularly interested with regard to the bladder function in the sacral nerves, uh, which are mediated through the pelvic nerve that includes S2, S3, and S4. And those are going to provide activation of the detrusor so that it contracts, uh, again, mediated through acetylcholine postganglionic. And, and this uh, contraction of the detrusor is what uh, allows us to empty our bladder. So assuming, again, uh, that we can appropriately relax the external uh, sphincters and pelvic floor musculature. So we're gonna talk through these as we talk about um, activation and management strategies um, of the bladder. So again, neurotransmitters in the parasympathetic nervous system, remember preganglionic and postganglionic, you have acetylcholine. That's that's how you mediate uh, neural activity in the parasympathetic nervous uh, system. In the sympathetic nervous system, your preganglionic fibers release acetylcholine, but the postganglionic fibers are releasing um, uh, adrenaline, if you will, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, the catecholamines. And those catecholamines then act on adrenergic, that is adrenaline, receptors Adrenergic one receptors uh, are going to mediate bladder neck contraction um, and uh, beta three adrenergic uh, receptors are going to mediate detrusor relaxation. So we'll, um, we'll utilize those to help us uh, to maintain uh, appropriate bladder pressures and appropriate uh, bladder continence. Um, and then again, remember the somatic uh, nervous system mediated through acetylcholine and instead of the muscarinic uh, receptors, uh, the somatic nervous system works uh, by the nicotinic receptors uh, to allow us control of the external sphincter um, and the pelvic floor musculature. So bladder filling, okay? We wanna think about uh, contraction of the sphincters and relaxation of the detrusor. Um, and so um, this is mediated through increased sympathetic nervous system activity along the hypogastric nerve. That is gonna to contribute to detrusor relaxation as you activate these beta-3 adrenergic receptors. Um, you're gonna have bladder neck contraction uh, 
mediated through the sympathetic nervous system um, by way of the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, and, and subsequently you're gonna, that's going to contribute to bladder storage. Remember, the parasympathetic nervous system, when it's activated, is going to cause detrusor uh, contraction. So under conditions of bladder filling, you're going to see a decrease in parasympathetic influences along the pelvic nerve, S2, 3, and 4. And you're going to see a, a reduction in detrusor contractility uh, because you have reduced parasympathetic influences, reduced uh, acetylcholine uh, delivery. Um, so this is going to also allow bladder filling, but only if your somatic nervous system is appropriately activated, causing external sphincter contraction and pelvic floor muscular uh, contraction. So putting all of these together, for bladder filling, we want to see increased sympathetic nervous system activity along the hypogastric nerve to contribute to detrusor relaxation by way of the beta-3 receptors and bladder neck contraction to facilitate um, the sphincter contractions and subsequently bladder storage. Under conditions of bladder filling, we're going to see a reduction in parasympathetic nervous system activity so that we see de de decreased uh, detrusor contractility, again, allowing bladder filling. And the somatic nervous system is going to be activated by way of the pedendal nerves to activate contraction of the external sphincter and the pelvic floor musculature. So this is our situation as we are filling the bladder. Um, we have relative bladder acontractility, if you will, during this time, or at least relaxation, um, whereas you have increased sphincter contraction. Now, bladder emptying is going to be just the opposite. So under conditions of bladder emptying, we're going to decrease sympathetic nervous system uh, activity along the hypogastric nerve um, so that we have a relative reduction in detrusor relaxation um, and a relative relaxation of the bladder neck. And ideally, through the somatic nervous system, reduction in the external sphincter uh, contraction, reduction in pelvic floor contraction. That is, you're going to have relative relaxation there. Bladder emptying is associated with increased parasympathetic nervous system activity along the pelvic nerve, S2, 3, and 4, are going to mediate detrusor contraction, again, through cholinergic, particularly muscarinic receptors. Um, and this is going to facilitate bladder contraction and, again, hopefully relaxation of the sphincter so that you don't have a high pressure situation. So now we're taking that large filled bladder and we're going to empty it again. Reduction in sympathetic nervous system activity during bladder emptying, um, increased parasympathetic nervous system activity to cause detrusor contraction and relaxation of the somatic nervous system uh, via the pendendal nerve to allow relaxation of the sphincters in the pelvic floor musculature. So that you're squeezing empty the uh, detrusor um, and facilitating passage through the bladder outlet. Um, so a neurogenic bladder. Now we come to the situation that we experience with our folks with spinal cord injury. A true spinal cord injury is going to be mediated um, upper motor neuron spasticity, okay? So spasticity, we've talked about before, um, like autonomic dysreflexia, as you have increased afferent information, it's gonna cause a, a uh, efferent outflow. Um, and as we're talking through the detrusor, uh, we're going to have detrusor contractility in response to the detrusor stretch. That is the final common pathway to the detrusor. That is the bladder wall. The sphincters, similarly, as they stretch, information from the spindles are being sent to the cord back down through uh, alpha motor neurons to the sphincters to cause a reflex contractility. So again, increase reflex activity now in both the detrusor and the sphincter, and this is dysenergic. Usually we have contract, contraction of the bladder and relaxation of the sphincter, and conversely, relaxation of the uh, detrusor and contraction of the sphincter. So that is when they are in synergy. Dyssynergy means that they are both trying to contract at the same time. And when that happens, it generates high pressure that can cause the urine to flow back up to uh, 
the ureters, and subsequently to the kidneys, leading to acute renal failure and or incontinence. Um, now, if you are lower down on the cord, so you're in the colonus medullaris region or the cauda equina um, region, remember this is going to be a lower motor neuron process, okay? So you're gonna be areflexic. Potentially you don't have afferent Im impulses coming back to the cord and or you don't have efferent uh, in information going back down along alpha motor neurons. And so you're gonna have a flaccid bladder, a contractile, okay, it won't contract, and you're going to have a flaccid sphincter, a contractile. So this is a situation that people can't control their sphincter, they're going to be leaking all the time, unless we manage it differently. So let's use what we know about the bladder uh, pharmacology, particularly uh, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is mediated through uh, uh, cholinergic um, neurotransmitters. Uh, we can talk about the somatic nervous system, which is also mediated through uh, acetylcholine. Um, and then the sympathetic nervous system we know uh, is mediated through the catecholamines. So how do we assess the bladder and why is that important? Um, you are going to know more about bladder physiology um, with spinal cord injury than just about any other population you go into, unless you're a urologist. Um, there is a specialty within urology called neurourology because they really do need to understand the relationships between sympathetic, parasympathetic, and somatic nervous system to be able to effectively manage the bladder. And we're going to talk about the goals in a moment. So how do we assess this? Um, we are going to be assessing the upper tract, okay, and the upper tract includes the kidneys and the ureters uh, in particular, through laboratory um, uh, evaluation, and this will include BUN, creatinine. Um, we are going to be uh, occasionally wanting to look at UA and cultures and sensitivities. Um, a nuclear renal scan tells us about relative function of the two kidneys. Um, and that's going to be very important if you've had damage to the kidneys because of uh, situations with hydrouret or hydronephrosis, for example. Um, a renal ultrasound is going to tell us about the integrity of the upper urinary tracts, particularly this is imaging of the ureters and the uh, kidneys themselves. And then potentially you may need to do uh, an abdominal CT to look at the uh, renal, so kidney, um, or ureter stones, and potentially uh, bladder stones as well, okay? Um, we do recommend uh, in the evaluation of the lower tract of the urinary system, cystoscopy every five to 10 years for somebody, especially who has an indwelling catheter because they are at high, high risk for stones, number one, uh, for infections, uh, but also for bladder cancer, particularly in the trigon area where you have the transitional um, cells uh, and the likelihood of carcinoma uh, is much greater if you have an indwelling catheter five to 10 years. Um, urodynamics are going to tell us about the relative, um, the volume pressure relationships within the bladder and the consequences of high pressures we're gonna talk through in a moment uh, with regard to the influence that may have on the upper tract. And then avoiding cystourethrogram, uh, again, telling us how much control the person has um, as they void. So let's talk through, I keep mentioning hydronephrosis. What, what in the heck is that? Um, so this is a, a kidney. Typically you wouldn't see much in the way of dilation of the renal pelvis. So this is the kidney itself. The renal pelvis is what empties into the ureters, okay? So you wanna see a relatively small um, renal pelvis and, and not distension of the ureters as all as you come through this. So if you are having some small amount of distension in the renal pelvis and the, the ureters, that tells you that you've had some pressure and you're gonna be knocking off some of the um, what are the smallest units uh, within the kidney, the nephrons, the glomeruli? Uh, so as you increase pressure against the, the uh, or within the kidneys, you can actually cause ischemia and subsequently death of the 
the nephrons, um, if you will. So if you have even greater pressures over a period of time, you're going to extend beyond just the renal pelvis into other areas of the kidney and you're gonna see more dilation of the ureters. Um, that's called a grade two hydronephrosis. Grade three hydronephrosis is you've knocked out about 50% uh, or more. Um, so somewhere between 50 and 75% of the kidney itself has been damaged because of these high pressures. And then a grade four hydronephrosis you can see that you've knocked out more than 90% of the, the uh, kidney functional cells, the glomeruli and the nephrons, okay? So you also see a significant amount of uh, hydrouretor, not just hydronephrosis. These are bad. These are, these are telling you this person no longer has functioning kidneys and they are going to need hemodialysis or they will die. Um, and so those are consequences of a, uh, an unopposed detrusor sphincter dysinertia. Um, and we wanna prevent that by all means. How do, we, how do we assess that? We look at urodynamic studies in which we put a, a um, bladder pressure gauge within, uh, within the bladder itself. We have a balloon. Whoops, that went too fast. Um, we have a... Uh, a pressure gauge also in the rectum to look at the uh, pressure and then we subtract those to determine what our actual um, detrusor uh, pressure is. So this is what we see. We're looking at bladder pressures. Um, and as we get those, we wanna see the pressure in the bladder under 40 centimeters of water. We wanna see um, as the person fills the uh, bladder to higher volumes, we got volumes on the x-axis, we got pressures on the y-axis here. As you increase the volume, you should see increasing EMG activity of the sphincters and the pelvic floor musculature, uh, but you don't wanna see a significant increase in pressure within the bladder. Um, and so under normal conditions, an individual uh, doing this uh, study, um, you ask them to uh, go ahead and let it flow, let it flow, um, and basically, they should be able to contract the detrusor, relax the sphincters so that you see a, a, uh, a cessation of EMG activity in the pelvic floor and in the sphincters. And then they can voluntarily contract the sphincter again and relax the detrusor to stop uh, during this period of time so that you see an increase EMG acti activity of the pelvic floor musculature and the external sphincters. And then you ask them to start up again and they contract the detrusor, relax the sphincter and you have a quiet EMG here. This is under normal conditions. Um, the problem with an upper motor neuron bladder, a hyperreflexic bladder with detrusor sphincter dysinergia is that you end up with a situation where as you fill the detrusor afferent, send information to the cord back down to the detrusor to cause con contraction a reflex contraction. The sphincters also, as you have that increased pressure against the sphincter, it stretches down. Those spindle afferents send information to the cord back down the alpha motor neuron to the uh, external sphincter pelvic floor musculature. Boy, I'm going too fast today. Um, and you end up seeing high pressures where you shouldn't when the detrusor and the sphincter are contracting at the same time, dysenergically, okay? And so as you fill, you're likely to see more and more of these. And as you have detrusor contraction and sphincter contraction, um, that generates very, very high pressures, okay? Up, upwards and above of 40 centimeters of water. This is because you've lost the coordination for the reciprocal innervation. Remember, under normal conditions, you should be able to contract the sphincter, I'm sorry, contract the sphincter, relax the detrusor, or contract the detrusor and relax the sphincter. Under these conditions, this is uh, basically uninhibited detrusor sphincter dysinergia, generating high pressures. So again, um, as we look at urodynamics on a tracing, what we're gonna be looking at is the pressure within the abdomen and the bladder itself. This is called the vesicular pressure. We're gonna have a rectal manometer, a rectal balloon as well, generating pressures. Um, and, and when you subtract one from the other, 
you end up with the actual detrusor pressure. And that's what we want to see being less than 40 centimeters of water. If I haven't mentioned 40 centimeters of water, that's the one thing that you should take away from this lecture because bladder pressures greater than 40 centimeters of water can cause hydroureter, hydronephrosis, acute renal failure and death, which is suboptimal. Yes, thank you. Um, oh, man, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself again. So upper motor neuron, this is an injury to the cord, is basically going to generate high pressures as your um, detrusor continues to contract all the time. This is like developing a, oh, contracture in a skeletal muscle. It becomes small and as Ed McGuire out of Michigan used to call it a small evil bladder, okay? Because it generates high pressures. This is going to lead to upper tract deterioration, acute renal failure and death, which is, yes, suboptimal. Um, a lower motor neuron, injury, on the other hand, is going to affect the conus medullaris or the cauda equina. This is going to leave you a situation where you have low pressures, the, the bladder doesn't contract, but neither do the sphincters. And so you're going to have overflow incontinence. Um, now, generally, let's step back for just a moment. Your bladder, your, just think about your bladder for a moment. As it fills and you get to a uh, about 300 cc's, depending upon your total size, et cetera, et cetera. 300 cc's tells you, you gotta go to the bathroom. I mean, you've got to relax. This is starting to hurt. As you get to 350 cc's, 400 cc's, most of us, I mean, we, we you know, are holding our legs together, activating the, ex, uh, the external sphincter, activating pelvic floor musculature, just trying to maintain continence, right? So, so that's at 350 cc's, 400 cc's. So when a person has 500 cc's or more over the weekend, ah, oh, this was so painful. There was a bladder volume recorded of 1200 cc's, 1200, not, not a 24, no, this was one time, intermittent calf, 1.2 liters, okay? That's three times what would be incredibly painful to you or I. And guess what? The individual, yes, had autonomic dysreflexia. Go figure. When they generated this kind of pressure, this kind of stretch. And when you have that kind of stretch to a muscle, if you stretch, overly stretch a skeletal muscle, uh, it hurts. And it hurts for a while. The bladder is similarly, when it's distended three times its normal volume, it, it causes micro tears within the smooth muscle itself. And those don't repair in a minute or an hour. It often takes three days, seven days to heal um, the same way that a, a skeletal muscle tear would take to heal. And so recognize that this person is gonna continue to have issues with autonomic dysreflexia probably for the next several days, including hypercontractility every time you go to stretch the bladder again, okay? So keep that in mind. The other scenario though is that your bladder doesn't contract at all, it just stretches and stretches, but it doesn't matter because you're not getting afferent signals back anyway. Um, and so the person just ultimately, even at these low pressures will leak, okay? And so you can see, you know, a thousand cc bladder with a lower motor neuron injury not have to worry about spasticity, not have to worry about autonomic dysreflexia because the injury is so low. That's not to say that it's not a bad situation. When you have a big boggy bladder, that's B cubed, big boggy bladders, um, those are going to be a, a nidus for infection. You have way too much volume and way too much time for bacteria to get around and, and party. And, and they, they just, they colonize, but then they, they move forward into urinary tract infections. Both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron bladders are at high risk for urinary tract infections. So I mentioned autonomic dysreflexia. Just a quick review, the number one cause of autonomic dysreflexia in spinal cord injury is number one, yeah, bladder. Okay, the number two cause is number two, the bowels, okay? So what happens is you have afferent influences from the bladder or the urinary system and this, the afferent signals ascend the cord and you get a reflex sympathetic outflow uh, that causes 
massive vasoconstriction of the splanting muscular bed, um, hypertensive crisis, stroke out and die, which would be suboptimal. What does that look like? Um, so again, you descend this bladder. This is a noxious stimulant. You and I would be feeling pain. Person with spinal cord injury, no. They just have these afferent signals that ascend the cord blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury with a reflex sympathetic outflow that causes splanchnic vasoconstriction and hypertension. Increased pressures are sensed by baroreceptors within the vascular tree that send information to the medulla, which sends information back to the heart and causes a relative bradycardia. But below the level of the injury, person remains vasoconstricted. Above the level of the injury, they have flushing, sweating, pounding headache we call autonomic dysreflexia. Okay, organ failure and death are the outcomes, suboptimal. Okay, so we've talked about urological causes being the number one cause of autonomic dysreflexia. What is comprised within that is bladder distension, bladder calculi, renal calculi, not trigonometry or geometry, but the calculi is really bad. Um, urinary tract infections, bladder spasms, trauma, cancer. All of these can cause autonomic dysreflexia in a person with spinal cord injury. And we have to go fishing to figure out what the actual cause is. So our goals of bladder management, how am I doing on time? Um, we wanna preserve the upper urinary tracts. That's gonna be pivotal to maintain good kidneys. Um, we want to prevent infection and calculi, not worried about algebra trigonometry. Calculi, that's the problem. Urinary continence is something that all of us would like to have. That leads to an improved quality of life and patient satisfaction, physically, economically, and socially. But remember, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And so we have to figure out the plans that are going to allow us to meet these goals. Now, as we look at uh, the person's priority, those with spinal cord injury, um, those with tetraplegia mostly would love to have arm and hand function back. The second highest priority, um, according to this survey uh, by Kim Anderson back in 2004, um, sexual function and truncal stability. How nice would life be if I could regain those things? But fourth on the list for tetraplegia is bladder and bowel control and concerns about autonomic dysreflexia. Similarly, individuals with paraplegia, they don't have to worry about arm hand function, truncal stability, but they do list high priority sex, and next on the list, bladder and bowel function and the worry of autonomic dysreflexia. So there uh, was recently, just last year, published in the Journal of Spinal Cord Injury Medicine, um, a, a, a significant effort uh, by the spinal cord injury scientific, clinical, and consumer groups uh, to provide more bladder management research. Um, Preclinical, this is animal types of uh, models, should be looking at tissue morphology, voiding dynamics, uh, systometry, and then metabolic cages to look at input and output. Um, for humans, uh, it's recommended that we include in our outcome metrics for any research project looking at bladder management after spinal cord injury, voiding diaries, uh, laboratory assessments, imaging studies, urophlometry, uh, uh, post-void residuals and neurodynamics. We'll talk through those in just a minute. Um, and then the uh, cystoscopy. Um, as well, uh, the consumers really wanted to make sure that we are having, or we are allowing them as they participate in these uh, clinical trials to report their um, assessment of quality of life with the quality in 30 or the quality in 30 short form um, and the international lower urinary tract function basic, basic data set. Um, okay, this is something that all of our residents should be familiar with. This represents uh, the orders sets that you should be using in Cerner. Okay, so when somebody comes over with a spinal cord injury, if you feel like um, they, they are telling you they have bladder sensation, but they've had an indwelling catheter, you wanna discontinue the indwelling catheter. Um, as long as their urine output is less than 2,500 cc's a day, if, it's, if they're putting out 3,000 cc's a day, 
you're going to have to cath them more than every three hours. That's just not practical, or they're going to develop high pressure or high volume bladders. Um, you want to replace the indwelling catheter with an intermittent catheterization protocol, ICP. Um, and in the hospital setting, because there's all kinds of bugs hanging around, uh, we're going to use a sterile technique, whether that is by the nurses um, and the staff or by the individual themselves. While in the hospital, we want them to use a sterile technique to minimize the risk for urinary tract infections. Every four, five, or six hours, documenting the volume, contacting, that's right, you, the house officer, for volumes greater than 500 cc's. Now, can I see a raise of hands from the residents? How many times have you been contacted for a bladder volume greater than 500 cc's? Zero, zero, I see that. Um, how many times did you write the orders to be contacted for a bladder volume greater than 500 cc? And, and so there's, there's a thought. Um, I know that you don't wanna be contacted too much, but seriously, if you distend your bladder almost twice its normal volume, you're causing damage, you're putting your, your patients at risk, our patients at risk. So please do include the order set to contact the house officer for volumes greater than 500 cc. This is dangerous, whether it's upper or lower motor neuron bladder. For those with incomplete spinal cord injury, they may have sensations, but again, using sterile technique and potentially lidocaine jelly, because as you pass the, pass the catheter through the urethra, it can be you know, somewhat painful or at least irritating. So lidocaine jelly takes, uh, uh, takes the edge off, if you will. Again, asking folks to document the volume. When to use an external catheter? If the person has a sphincterotomy or a urethral stent, I'm okay with an external collection device, okay? But if they don't, then what are you thinking? You're thinking that they're gonna be using reflex voiding techniques, and we'll talk through that in a moment. Um, I only wanna use an indwelling catheter if it's not practical to do intermittent catheterization protocols, okay? If I'm going to be using uh, an indwelling catheter for months or more, then actually I would rather use a suprapubic than a urethral catheter because there are fewer um, side effects associated with this, fewer urinary tract infections, less likelihood of developing stones and less likelihood of developing transitional cell carcinoma, okay? So if you're gonna have an indwelling catheter with a balloon, then for a long period of time, consider using a suprapubic catheter. Now, avoiding trial. Person is telling you, no, I, I can sense when my bladder is getting full, I can, I can tell. And, and yes, I think I can empty. And so we will allow them avoiding trial. How do we do that? We offer them the urinal every four to six hours um, and then document the volume that they are able to voluntarily void. But then we don't stop. Then we document the post void residual, the PVR, okay? After they void, how much urine is left in their bladder, okay? If it is more than 50 cc's, I'm not satisfied um, and, and I want them to be able to get to the point where they can empty um, to the point of having no more than 50 cc's in there. If they have 100 cc's, I worry that they're going to have to cath or empty more frequently, that they're going to be causing um, the likelihood of urinary tract infection. Once their PVRs times three have been documented less than 50 cc's, then I can discontinue the around the clock intermittent catheterization protocol. Thoughts, questions about this, this bladder management? Um, because um, back in the day, uh, up until the mid 70s, um, we never did intermittent catheterization. And it was Ed McGuire at the University of Michigan who was the major proponent, a neurourologist, and, and it changed uh, the way that we look at spinal cord injury. It changed the number of people dying with acute renal failure. Um, because we were um, reducing urinary tract infections, we were reducing these high pressure bladders. So what are the considerations? Um, In I the long run. Question, Dr. Gator. Yes. Um, when you're doing the voiding trials, you said that you're offering the urinal and that's a standard. Yes. Do you think you would have any better results if you were to have like request that during those voiding trials, the patient be seated on the toilet? Yes, that would be ideal. Uh, the, the problem is sometimes they don't recognize until they don't have enough time 
And by the time you get them out of bed and into uh, onto the toilet, that would be the ideal. I agree. Yeah. But the reality is that we deal with is our nurses are pretty busy and we're just trying to allow the person to demonstrate that they can empty. But you are right. If they're in bed and they empty, they may empty in completely just because of their position. And so to the extent possible, getting them up on a commode would be absolutely ideal. Because maybe we can even have a request. Um, I know I've tried to speak with the nurses about this because I understand the time constraints are really tough. What if we could have as at least make a comment or something in the within Cerner to say like what the position was of the patient, like if the volume, especially if they're kind of in a gray area, I like and maybe that. they could have the elevated head of the bed at the very least to allow gravity to assist in any way. Sure. Um, just so like, you know, because there is some inconsistency there. And I know for neurotypical individuals, a lot of times they have incomplete voiding when supine, you know, so. Who doesn't? I mean, you and I probably also have incomplete voiding. Right. If, if we were in that kind of a, a position. So yes, so residents, did you catch that? Ideally upright on a commode to empty the bladder, but practically it may not be possible. And so we're just trying to help them maintain continence uh, in the midst of this. Great points. Um, so why do intermittent catheterization? There's less chance of stones, less chance of infections, less chance of transitional cell carcinoma with an indwelling urethral catheter. Um, the goals are to maintain volumes less than 500 cc's. Ideally, I like to see it less than 400 cc's um, and to have a post void residual if they're voiding less than 50 cc's. Usual practice in the hospital is a, a sterile technique. Before we send them home, we're gonna teach them how to do the clean technique that doesn't require you know, the iodine prep, the sterile gloves and all of that. If they are the only ones or their care provider is the only one that's gonna be doing this, they're gonna colonize with one flora, one bacterial flora, and that's okay. They're unlikely to get a urinary tract infection, but if they have multiple providers doing the intermittent catheterization, we should probably stick with sterile technique because they likely will develop a urinary tract infection. Whenever possible, the touchless catheters are preferred. Um, and we can talk through that a little bit. Um, so this is desirable for those with uh, sufficient hand control to be able to do intermittent catheterization. Um, some folks with C6 because of their tenodesis and, and facilitated equipment, can um, do intermittent catheterization independently, but most folks, probably two thirds of folks with C6 uh, tetraplegia um, and, and above aren't going to be able to do this independently. Um, so if, uh, if you can't do the ICP, what would lead to that? So you, you've got strictures, scarring, you can't pass the catheter. The bladder capacity is less than 200 cc's they are unable or unwilling to adhere to an intermittent cath schedule. They have a high fluid intake. They can't drink less than, you know, uh, a, a, a couple of thousand cc's a day. Um, the tendency towards autonomic dysreflexia, that, that's bad, that could kill them. If intermittent catheterization is not working for them and causing autonomic dysreflexia, I would rather them live and use an indwelling catheter uh, than to promote autonomic dysreflexia because of uh, frequent bladder distension. And then some folks are just adverse to passing a, cath uh, passing a catheter multiple times a day. So if they're gonna do intermittent catheterization, let them know that there are these risks. That's usually better than autonomic dysreflexia, uh, stones and urinary tract infections, uh, which you're gonna see very likely with indwelling catheters. Um, but doing intermittent catheterization can lead to urinary tract infections over distension, bladder incontinence, bladder stones, and potentially autonomic dysreflexia. So you got to be able to do this uh, appropriately. I've mentioned urinary tract infection a couple of times. What is it? Uh, so significant bacteriuria, more than uh, 10 to the fifth colony forming units um, with pyuria, that is white blood cells, depending, um, usually greater than 20. Uh, thousand, but um, you know, twenty to fifty thousand. If it's less than twenty thousand, I'm reluctant to move forward as if this is a urinary tract infection, unless I also have positive nitrites and leuk esterase. Um, the in between—that's the hard part. If I've got fifteen thousand whites uh, and and I got negative nitrites and I've got you know 
minimal to moderate leukesterase. Ah, is this really a urinary tract infection? We don't want to create uh, resistant organisms. And so you might want to let this play itself out. Um, or if the person is symptomatic. Okay, so if they've got fever, rigor, pain, malaise, then I'm going to call this a urinary tract infection. If they don't, then I'm probably not going to call it a urinary tract infection. If they don't have cloudy, odorous urine and they don't have these things, I'm not going to say it's a urinary tract infection, especially if they're not having autonomic dysreflexia and spasticity. If they have new incontinence, I'm probably going to call it a urinary tract infection. So some of this is a judgment. It's not as clear cut as we would like it to be. But if you do have questions, uh, feel free to contact your attendings and or our urologists uh, colleagues if this is happening frequently. So most folks will develop asymptomatic bacteriuria where they colonize with a single type, a single flora of bacteria, um, and the collection mode is gonna make a difference, okay? If you suspect a urinary tract infection with somebody with an indwelling catheter, don't you know open the catheter bag, take your sample and send it. No, 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 no. Empty the bag, get a new sample, a clean sample to send so that we know that you're not just um, uh, sending them flora, mixed flora from the bag itself. I wanna jump ahead because I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit wordy and, and not getting as much information across. Um, recurrent urinary tract infections usually tell me that the person is having bad technique, that they've got bladder or uh, renal stones or a, a bladder diverticulum that is uh, recolonizing, recolonizing, recolonizing uh, with bacteria. So usually uh, prophylaxis is not something that we provide. Um, they uh, sometimes, if you feel like it might be helpful, mandelamine and vitamin C um, would be a good option, but there's only one or two manuscripts over many years that demonstrate the efficacy. So, you know, nitro, uh, nitro furantoin, I'm sorry, um, also, used sometimes, but the literature is not great that this is gonna prevent true urinary tract infections. The literature on cranberry tablets is incomplete um, and um, I don't advocate for it. Some people swear by it, um, some people swear at it. I'm probably in the latter category myself. So for a lower motor neuron bladder, a person um, can be safely emptying their bladder uh, by crede and Valsalva uh, techniques. So for those with the sphincterotomy, um, with low, lower motor neuron injuries, low pressure bladders, um, I don't like to use this for folks with uh, upper motor neuron bladders because it's likely to generate high pressures and cause hydroureter, hydronephrosis, acute renal failure, and death. I, I don't advocate for that. Um, avoid this, therefore, in folks who have known detrusor sphincter dysinergia and BOO, bladder outlet obstruction, um, those with vesicular ureteral reflux and, and autonomic dysreflexia. Um, indwelling catheter is a last resort, um, not the Disneyland or Disney World resort. No, this is, this is everything else has failed and this is our only way of keeping the person dry. Um, so if you use this and the person continues to get urinary tract infections and you're sure there's not stones there, consider using hydrophilic or silver impregnated catheters, indwelling catheters, those are less likely to cause urinary tract infections. Again, if you're gonna have an indwelling catheter, I would prefer not to use a urethral indwelling catheter, but instead a suprapubic catheter. This needs to be changed out once monthly. Um, and um, again, uh, you're gonna have this scenario, particularly uh, you've got somebody who's had an indwelling urethral catheter for a long time, they develop prostatitis, urethritis, epididymoporchitis, all of those itises would warrant a suprapubic catheter. Um, again, recognizing there are complications associated with indwelling catheters. Okay, consider and then discard most of the time. I'll just put it this way. Um, this would be a great uh, journal club for those of you interested in, in, in finding a, a good topic for journal club. Um, the, the relative safety of reflex voiding with upper motor neuron bladders. And, and I would say, I don't like it um, because of these complications that go along with it. So let's take the remaining time, and I don't have much, uh, to talk about pharmacological interventions, okay? Alpha blockade, basically to try to relax if you've got bladder outlet obstruction. 
anti-muscarinics to reduce detrusor contractility. Uh, the beta-3 adrenergic agonists, you don't have many, but a couple, also to provide detrusor relaxation to reduce the high pressure bladders and consider Botox as we go through there. So the alpha blockers are gonna help open the urethra near the prostate. Uh, you're gonna avoid this in persons with symptomatic hypotension. Why? Because they'll, oh, pass out. Syncope is not something I'm promoting for our folks with spinal cord injury. So if you've got a patient that you're gonna initiate alpha blockade with, consider taking the first doses at night while they're supine. And it, and it doesn't matter if they pass out as much. Uh, uh, recognize that uh, using erectile dysfunction drugs with alpha blockades can be problematic uh, as well. These are some options. Um, you've seen uh, most of these, uh, recognize that all of them can be very, very helpful. Um, find out which one works best for your patient and um, at the lowest cost, ideally, uh, would be the way to go with this. Um, beyond uh, alpha blockade is the uh, anti-muscarinic therapies. So particularly M3 receptors um, seem to be uh, especially um, populating the bladder wall. Um, M2 it, it, it receptors are the most prevalent, uh, but the person seems to be most responsive to the M3 blockade, if you can do that. Part of the reason why you wanna be selective with M2 or M3 blockade is because they have fewer side effects associated. That is dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, uh, et cetera. Um, and I, I'm gonna jump ahead in the interest of time. Uh, the beta-3 adrenergic agonists only been uh, available for a relatively short time. The Miravegron uh, beta-3 adrenergic agonists also promote detrusor relaxation. Um, so uh, they've been able to demonstrate at least in combination with established anti-muscarinic therapies. This can also be very effective to help reduce your bladder pressures, increase your bladder capacity as we go through there. And then more and more folks are considering uh, using Botox to the bladder itself. Um, and if you have bladder out of obstruction to the, uh, uh, the uh, sphincters, uh, recognize that this is going to provide you relief for approximately three to six months, keeping low pressures during that time. Uh, recognize you're not gonna provide the Botox to somebody who has a neuromuscular disease or who has an allergy to Botox. Um, potential complications during the procedure include autonomic dysreflexia, be prepared. Um, so stents can be uh, helpful if you're going to try to keep the bladder outlet open um, and you don't mind using an external collection device. Um, so uh, you would consider this for these types of scenarios, um, recognizing that uh, in addition to, to the stents, you could do a sphincterotomy. The problem with the sphincterotomy is it often scars down again, and without knowing it, you can generate um, uh, distended bladders uh, again as you go through there. And then finally, um, no longer available commercially, there are still uh, research trials going on looking at uh, the uh, stimul electrical stimulation of both bowel and bladder. Um, and in Europe, actually, they've developed this now so that instead of just two buttons, one for bladder uh, uh, voiding, one for bowel defecation, you also have a third one that will stimulate an erection. Um, you just have to be careful which buttons you push. Um, procedural complications uh, are associated with that, obviously. And then finally, for the small evil bladder, consider bladder augmentation where you take a portion of the gut, typically the ileum, you scrape off the mucus uh, producing components and you sew it into the bladder itself to increase your bladder volume. You can combine this with a stoma as well. Um, and in some cases, again, renal cancer, uh, I'm sorry, bladder cancers, et cetera, you may have to remove the bladder altogether. And so in those scenarios, you can have a urinary diversion uh, going from the ureters um, and out through a, a portion of the ileum that is sewn into this, developing a ureteral, ureteral ileostomy, uh, for example. And then um, some of you have heard about the Mitrofenov uh, append appendicovesicostomy, sorry, um, where you actually pass the catheter through the belly button 
now uh, with a little tunnel that goes directly to the bladder itself. When you remove the catheter, you've got a little flap uh, here that basically closes and as the bladder fills, the volume of urine actually keeps it continent um, as you're going through there. So I covered a lot of information very, very quickly. Uh, this may be one of the most important uh, aspects of all spinal cord injury care. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes left if there are questions, thoughts, concerns, or if everybody's fallen asleep, I'll, I'll just talk to myself for a few more minutes. So Dr. Gator, I thank you for that lecture. I just had a question that the patient who went into autonomic dysreflexia that you were mentioning earlier, um, the situation was he was told that his urine was a little concentrated, so the nursing staff told him to drink more water. Uh, he was being uh, straight cathed every three hours, so he did not miss a catheter. He just so happened to drink an extra 1.2 liters in between there. Um, is that something nursing should be just monitoring eyes and O's in between, or how do we get a head start on that before... Yeah, it's, there, there's always the danger when you tell somebody to start drinking more, they start drinking, you know, liters and liters of fluid. And so we have to rec we have to communicate um, effectively. Um, you couldn't have really known except that as he started developing symptoms of AD, um, they should have considered immediately done a, um, a you know, a um, bladder ultrasound, and they would have been able to have, uh, you know, recognize sooner rather than later. The other thing is, I don't know if they had the orders on there to contact the house officer uh, for volumes greater than a certain amount. Um, my understanding was that the folks that were on over the weekend weren't contacted about this and it didn't come up until rounds and, and I, uh, we were all shocked at the, the volume. So uh, again, uh, it, I know the house officers don't like to be contacted, but these are emergency kinds of situations that they should be contacted for. And we need to work on our, on our communication um, with nursing, house officers, and attendings as we go through there. Again, not pointing fingers, just saying these things happen, and how can we make sure that we're providing very safe care uh, to our patients who really don't understand the dangers of autonomic dysreflexia. Great points. Thank you all. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, we'll continue on next week. Yeah, Everybody. and just another quick point. If you have people with incomplete spinal cord injuries who have weaned off of intermittent catheterization, PT, pelvic PT is an option, an outpatient. <laughs> Not that you would know anything about that, would you just <laughs> Just a quick plug. <laughs> no, no, Yo, no, feel free to plug. email me with cases if you're curious if I could even because sometimes I can't help but that's okay I'm very honest with people um, but feel free to reach out I'm here right. <laughs> so instead of using a plug contact Justine yeah <laughs> all right thanks all have a great day thank you